of affairs in this land today and pretty much the world. Already prayers to our Father, and I'm sure it goes on daily with members of the Lord's Church who are faithful, are offered petitioning Him that we might have things in a peaceful situation. The song we just participated in talks about peace, perfect peace, while you're in the midst of a mess. Most of us tend to define peace contrary to the way that the Bible says the faithful child of God is to conceive of peace. Now Jesus knew that. He knew how anchored we are in the flesh and in time and in space and material things. He was a human like you are and I am. He understood what draws and pulls and is a strain on humans. To the apostles regarding their work as his ambassadors of the court of heaven and the way and through whom we receive the New Testament of Jesus Christ along with the prophets of the New Testament. Jesus here specifically addressing the apostles said, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Then he says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. This seems kind of contradictory, doesn't it? In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. But here's why. I have overcome the world. John 16, 32 and 33. When I read these passages, knowing originally they were addressed to the apostles regarding their work, and then I read the rest of the New Testament, especially when it comes to Peter and John, and even more than that, Paul, and see all of the trials, tribulations, sufferings, and anguish they, they were upon them in persecution because they preached and defended the truth and lived according to the truth. Then I asked the question to myself, now I'm reading this for David Brown's benefit. And you can substitute your name where I put mine, and when you read it, it ought to be for your benefit. How does that help me? Because Paul, an apostle himself, and we've quoted this many times, said in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, and now it goes beyond the apostles and their work, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you are godly in the church, if you're faithful to the Lord, you will undergo persecution. Now there's no persecution that's pleasant. None of it is. Some of it is a lot worse than others. As I often say, a sin is a sin is a sin as far as it's separating you from God, being that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. But some sins, because of their consequences, are much worse. In other words, murder is a sin. Lying is a sin. Now, if I have a choice of what you do to me, I will take lying about me all day long over your murdering me. So, I trust that we see the difference in the consequences of sin, but any sin separates from God. When you consider murder contrasted with the command of God not to eat to Adam and Eve, the forbidden fruit in the garden, there's a big difference in eating a fruit and committing murder. The point is, sin is sin. Sin is your greatest enemy. 
That's all our greatest enemy. You may think there are a lot of other troubles, but no sin. Sin's your big problem. Transgressing God's law, either omitting what he obligates us to do or violating what he told us not to. It is our problem. That is the biggest problem you have. You say, well, I'm fighting cancer. Something's going to kill you in this life. It's appointed unto men once to die. Well, I'm fighting this, that, or the other in health. Well, did you really think you're going to go to heaven in this body? This time on earth is very fleeting, very fragile. Some live longer in the flesh than others, but we all die. And yet we still keep living like, oh, we have forever. And the Lord says, be prepared. Well, I don't know any other way to be prepared for whatever day I die or the Lord's second coming other than to know the truth and honestly keep it. Then you're prepared whether it's at 3 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon or any other time when you leave this world. That's being faithful. But I do know this. Christ wanted us and he offers us and he's the only one that can do it through the gospel system. A peace in the midst of tribulation even being persecuted because you love the truth and live it and will not compromise it. Well, it can't be a peace like we had after World War II ended. It's not that kind of peace. It's a peace that comes by knowing you have done honestly the truth of God relating to your forgiveness of sins and that he has forgiven you of your sins. That as you have believed in his son, and Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And having believed, if you've repented of your sins, Acts 17.30, because he commands all men everywhere to repent. And if you have confessed your faith in Christ following repentance, and we must, Romans 10, 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Then you're qualified, and if you, being qualified, are immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the forgiveness or remission of sins, being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, verse 38. All past sins are remitted. The Lord adds you to the realm of the saved, the church, his spiritual body, the family of God. You have peace. Nobody can take that away from you. You know the only one that can do that? You and me. So the peace he offers is knowing that you're acceptable to God. Jesus tells us who to fear, and it's not those who can kill the body, but that's who we usually fear, or things that pertain to time and space, material things in our physical lives. He says we ought to fear him who after we're dead hath power to cast into hell. The scripture references of John 16, 32 and 33 I say again, because of the terrible tribulation and persecution the apostles had to undergo in doing the work he charged them to do, was delivered to them shortly before he died such a terrible death. He tells them a lot of things they don't understand. He says, you're going to be scattered. And that did happen when he was arrested, Matthew 26, verse 56. They, in their weakness, would leave Jesus, would forsake him. But he knew something. He knew the Father wouldn't. He says, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. We sing a song sometimes, can't think of anything worse than being alone. Well, we're never alone if we're faithful to the Lord. And even if we're nailed to a cross because we believe in him and won't compromise the truth, we're never alone. We'll see more about that later. So Jesus encouraged the apostles by declaring to them that he had overcome the world. Does that mean anything to you and me? I mean, remember when you were obedient to the gospel? What were you seeking when you responded to the gospel invitation? Forgiveness of sins. Why? You wanted to be acceptable to God. You wanted your sins forgiven. You wanted to stand justified before God. You wanted to have heaven as your home when this life is over. It's important to emphasize 
that this was said by Jesus to the apostles before, before his crucifixion and resurrection. That's interesting. He said, I've overcome the world, but yet he still has a crucifixion to go through, and he hasn't been resurrected until after he dies. But what is being revealed here is that these events were so certain. Our Lord could speak of them as though they had already happened. They are the facts of what would be. Jesus, in effect, was vaccinating his apostles with the courage, the courage to endure the trials they would face. As he mentioned in John 16 in verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think they do God service. But this continued to be done by the apostles themselves to the church, that is, encouraging the church. Paul encouraged the brethren on his first preaching tour, Acts 14, 21 and 22, Luke records, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, Confirming the souls of the disciples. You ever think much about your soul needing to be confirmed now that you're a member of the church and what you do to confirm your brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, look at this next part. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them. You can't do one without the other. That conjunction and says wherever there's going to be the confirmation of souls, there's going to be the exhortation of them. Part of the preaching of the gospel is to preach the word, be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. Now Jude said contend for the faith. And of course, we often point out that's a synecdoche where part stands for whole or whole for part. And in this case, it's a part standing for the whole gospel system, God's power to save men from sin. So we contend for the faith, whether it's the whole New Testament or the Bible, or whether it's any one component part of the gospel system, we contend for it. We don't tamper with any of it, we stand up for it. And in so doing, then we're mindful of edifying the brethren, ourselves and the brethren. And that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Acts 14, 21 and 22. He didn't say in just tribulation, but he said much tribulation. How much is much? It's more than a little. And just read what Paul said happened to him because he loved the truth and loved the Lord, loved the souls of men, would not compromise the truth. And we'll understand that. We suffer in this life on account of persecution of some sort or the other, to one extent or the other, sin, hardship, sickness, more, just simply being human in the flesh, what all goes along with that. But we too should take courage, as the apostles were told to do, and for the same reason. So the question is this, how can we, members of the church, of which we read about on the pages of the New Testament. How do we take courage? It's something I must do. How do we take courage in the face of tribulation? Well, Jesus gave three reasons as to how Christians can take courage. No great thing it takes to find those three things. Jesus overcame the world. Now, if he hadn't done that, we couldn't. If our Lord had not overcome the world, what does that mean? He sub subjugated his appetites of the flesh, lest the flesh, lest the eyes of pride of life, and did not let them in any form or fashion, to any degree, at any time, in mind, word, and life, cause him to violate the Father's will. The writer of Hebrews says he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus, he could go to the cross and die on our behalf. 
And aren't you glad he did? Now, how did the Lord do this? Well, he lived a sinless life, as I just pointed out. The writer of Hebrews said of him, he was holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners. Jesus described Satan as the ruler of this world. See, whatever power Satan had, God allows him to have it, and he is the ruler of this world, and he works through getting people, that is, he works through the appetites of the flesh that we all have because we're humans, to get us to violate God's will. Yet the Lord said, he has nothing in me, John 14, 30. Isn't that amazing? You ever read all that so fast you don't even think about what it means? Satan could stand there as it were and, uh, and accuse Jesus of everything you want to accuse him, but he couldn't prove any of it. It wasn't there. There was no sin in our Lord's life. And that's the reason anybody that is cleansed by the blood of Christ and obedience to the gospel as I went through it earlier in the sermon and who is faithful day by day, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7, is continually covered by the blood of Christ. And on the day of judgment, Satan, if he could be standing there accusing, would have nothing in us. Be thou faithful unto death, and what? I'll give you a crown of life. The victory crown. Jesus never succumbed to any temptation put before him by Satan. Next of all, Jesus overcame the world by being raised from the dead. See, death is in the world because of sin. There wouldn't be any death if it wasn't for sin. The warning to Adam and Eve was, if you eat of that tree that I have told you not to, then you're going to die. Well, die does not mean go out of existence or go unconscious. It means you are separated from me. And there needs to be reconciliation. The gospel plan of salvation and the gospel system brings about that reconciliation. It's the only thing that can. It causes justification by the blood of Christ. So we ask in the old song, are you washed in the blood? Are we saying there's power in the blood? It's because of the truth of these things. Peter said in that first recorded gospel sermon that Luke gives us in Acts 2.24, concerning Jesus, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now listen very significant because it was not possible that he should be holden of it why he committed no sin he went through the process of death for our good the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world why could he do that he was sinless so Paul wrote that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, Romans 1.4. And that proves that Satan and the world had no power over him. Now when you read Galatians 3.27, and Paul reminds the Galatians of what they did when they became Christians, and he talks about them being baptized into Christ. And we learn from Romans 6, that's a baptism into his death. But it was in his death where he shed his blood. But his blood was shed for the remission of our sins. How do I contact the blood? Well, we've gone over that already in the plan of salvation. So there can be no power over us if we have his power. And there is power in the blood. And the gospel is the power of God to salvation because of that blood shed from the sinless Christ, Romans 1, 16. So why it must be preached to every creature under heaven. For that's the way salvation from sin is offered and no other way. So this world is filled with trouble. Always will be. It'll surge this way and that and be different kinds of something going on all the time. But why do we expect out of this world that Satan controls to ever find any peace in it. Not ultimately and finally. In the way the world functions. Satan's not going to let you do that because remember, we're warned. Our adversary, the devil, who is a roaring lion, 
both about seeking whom he may devour. Now, does he take a vacation? Is Satan off for the summer? Sounds like to me, he's working pretty well in the summer. Any other time, there may be times that because he is a being, he's not omniscient, omnipotent, and so forth. He's, he's a being, supernatural being, but he's not God. Don't ever think Satan has the power of God. Satan thought he was victorious when Christ died on the cross. But it all worked out in the scheme of redemption. The very thing he did to Christ, which had been predicted back over in Genesis 3, was the thing that was used to overcome Satan. So he's limited. He doesn't know. We may have a hard time understanding that as finite human beings as a supernatural power, the source of all evil and all wickedness. Can be limited what he knows. He, he doesn't know. He knows that he's condemned. He knows out there in the future somewhere he must be cast a lake of fire and brimstone. Remember that place is prepared for the devil and his angels. But he just works that much harder. It's always been interesting to me to see that his servants operate the same way. When Hitler knew that he was fully defeated, what did he want to do? He wanted to burn Germany to the ground. It didn't change him. It just made it worse. After Pharaoh said, well, we'll let the children of Israel go, what happened? He regretted it and started back after them. They never learned their lesson because their mind is on this present world. They're under the control of Satan because they will to do that. This world's filled with trouble. But we have the peace that passes understanding because we overcome through Jesus Christ and his gospel. As Paul wrote, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 37. It may be that righteous people burn Houston to the ground in every other city. It may be that we have a pestilence come upon us in some way or the other that will make the black plague look like a head cold. I don't know. We think like because we're Americans. It cannot happen here. You look at the young people. You look at people around about it. It's not as bad as it seems. That will happen to you. Won't happen to me. <laughs> now people have operated that way a long time. People don't think. Yes, they do. Let me take that back. Here's the way most of us think. i got to work it out to suit myself. <laughs> it's got to fit in my little square or circle, whichever way you like it. And it'll, it'll work out to suit me and my viewpoint of things. When we say, what kind of worldview do you have? We're talking about, do you view the world the way God views the world and reveals it in the New Testament? Or do we try to take those things and twist them around so that the New Testament will fit my personal human view of the world? Though we become the slave to sin when we commit sin, and that's how you do it, Jesus makes us free so that we are free indeed, John 8, 32 through 36. He's promised to provide the way of escape every time that our faith in God is put to the test, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, so that we are never forced to sin, never have to succumb to Satan's powers. That means we've got to spend a lot of time studying the Bible and understanding his will for us with a desire to submit to it. He also frees us, frees us from the fear of death, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Touched on this a little bit last week. How does he do that? Because a faithful child of God has the expectation of the resurrection. I like to listen to people who tell me that I'll walk out of my grave someday, and I don't pay much attention to those who tell me that when you're dead, you're like a little dog Grover, you're dead all over, and that ends you. Somebody asked one time, Why do you believe in God? Now, on the surface, this sounds rather ridiculous, but it's because I want to. Well, why do I want to? Look at the other alternative. Are you the product of multiplied billions of years of chance evolution starting out from nothing 
and nothing got busy and created something and you're only matter in motion? That's all, just by happenstance. And when you reach the end of your days, you'll just go out of existence. You'll just cease to be. God offers me eternal life through Christ and His gospel. Now you show me somebody else that can do that. You show somebody else that's lived the perfect life, though tempted in every point like as we are and without sin, who died on my behalf and who was raised from the dead by the power of God to die no more and says, you can have it too because I've blazed the trail. Paul told the Corinthian brethren, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also, notice, in, in Christ, all will be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and 22. Just as Jesus overcame the world, we can overcome the world through the gospel system and our faithfulness adherence to it and letting God have his way with us through Christ. Now, what does that mean? Take courage. That's what the Lord told the apostles. I've overcome the world. I'm not alone. Though you leave me, I'm not alone. The Father's with me. And he would say, I do always those things that please him. God does not forsake his own. Maybe you remember when you were a child pretty small child and there were some bigger kids you were out with maybe they were brothers and sisters who knows everybody's playing running around and they run off and leave you and you say wait on me don't leave me here alone don't do that can you remember being small and being alone God doesn't forsake his own now the apostles deserted the Lord but the Father didn't. Jesus said earlier, And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. John 8, 29. Now shouldn't that be our motto in guiding light and north star? The Father didn't leave Jesus because he always did the Father's will. However, when Jesus was on the cross... It appeared, and underscore the word appeared, as though the Father did leave him. Sometimes we don't understand this. Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. But I'm telling you that even then the Father did not forsake the Son. Our Lord was quoting from Psalm 22. If you had read Psalm 22, you probably read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, read Psalm 22. If you read some commentaries, they'll say that good possibility quoted all of Psalm 22. Inspiration just gives us this part. If you'll read Psalm 22, you'll see why some have come to that conclusion. It's a psalm that is describing in detail the events of the crucifixion. We know about Isaiah 53. Have you really read uh, uh, Psalm 22? The psalmist even went on to explain that God was to be praised. Why? Because he never forsook the suffering one. Now listen, Psalm 22, 22 through 24. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised, nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Now listen. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Again, Psalm 22, 22 through 24. That's the reason some people think that 
Jesus quoted all of Psalm 22 on the cross. And inspiration just records that one. But you see, you have a contradiction if you say, well, God forsook Jesus on the cross. Christ said he never did. And the prediction was in Psalm 22 he wouldn't. And Christ quoted part of Psalm 22. Don't you know that means he believed in all of it? But if you read all of it, it says God didn't forsake him. That he was the sacrifice for sin. That he died on behalf of others who were separated from God. In a sense, there was the fact that he was that sacrifice. But that sacrifice means it's acceptable to God. The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So through all the hardships that we endure, God is with us. Sometimes we still think too much like people. We get down and out and knocked out and sick and somebody's mad at us or something's going on. And we say, oh, woe is me. What's happened? What am I doing wrong? What shall I have done? It doesn't hurt to take fair inventory of yourself, that's for sure. But you ought to do it in the light of the right and divided word of truth and all honesty. Whoso looketh in the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Can you know if you're doing that? Well, can you know you read that from the Bible? And is that part of the Word of God? And is that the way that you know that you're right with God? Well, certainly it is. The writer of Hebrews reminded the Christians of this fact. Let your conversation, your whole manner of life, your conduct, be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. Well, right there would remove a whole lot of folks' problems because they're not content with what they have. For he has said, now you think, you ask yourself that question we asked at the beginning. What does this mean to me in my Christian life? For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that ye, we may boldly say, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man, what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Written to Jewish Christians who were thinking about leaving because of persecution, for the cause of Christ, the whole New Testament system. Will that give you peace in the midst of all manner of persecution and privation? It certainly will. And by the way, if it doesn't, there's nothing that can. Earlier, the Hebrews writer reminded these brethren that it is impossible for God to lie, so that they, and I uh, must insert here, we, may have a strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us, Hebrews 6.18. Just as the Father never forsook the Son, so we can be assured that He will never forsake us. Now, what's the conclusion? So, take courage. Tribulation is only in this world. That's the next point Christ made. Before he came to earth, before the world was, Jesus shared in glory with the Father, John 17, 5. But when he became a human and lived on earth, Jesus faced the hardships all humans do. And on one occasion he said that he had nowhere to lay his head, Matthew 8, 20. You have any place to lay your head? Besides, what he endured in life, he had to suffer the cruel, ignominious death on a cross, Philippians 2.8. Nevertheless, he left us a pattern of life, an example. The Hebrews writer explained, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, Hebrews 12.2. So he went through all of this to make a way for us to go to heaven. Uh, he won't remove trouble, but he teaches us how to get over that trouble. First of all, it's only in this life. All these things we face because we're in the flesh, because we have to fight the fight of faith, it's only in this life. When you compare our hope of heaven to anything in this life, then this is, as Paul said, momentary. It's our light affliction and our hope of eternal life is far beyond all comparison, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. We have the assurance that there will be no troubles in heaven. 
He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. These things have passed away, Revelation 21.4. But we must be faithful to the Lord to obtain this. The scripture says as we close, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city, Revelation 22.14. Brethren, whatever hardships we have to endure in this life will not be carried over into heaven. What's our Lord's conclusion? Third time, so take courage. As I said, we studied a little while ago the plan of salvation. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it because today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If as a child of God, the affairs of this world have pulled you away, from serving God, then we ask you to repent of those sins, and you know them as God knows them with you. Turn from them, pray God for forgiveness as you've confessed them. We'll pray with you and for you. Let's help each other go to heaven the Lord's way. If you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.